our distinguished keynote uh, speaker for today is Conrad Hirschler, who needs no introduction to all readers of uh, classical uh, Arabic literature, classical uh, Islamic history and civilization as well. Conrad is a professor of Islamic studies at the Fry University at Berlin and former professor of Middle Eastern history at SOAS London. He's a distinguished educator, distinguished researcher. His books won many awards, many prizes. He supervised many PhD students, uh, but I'll focus today on his research and his books. Uh, his research focuses on Egypt and Syria in the Ayyubid and Mamluk periods, uh, uh, 12th century to 15th century. He is the author of uh, Medieval Syrian Book Cultures, his most recent book from Edinburgh University Press, 2021. He is also the author of Medieval Damascus, also Edinburgh University Press, 2016, The Written Word in the Medieval Arabic Land, uh, also Edinburgh University Press 2012, and Medieval Arabic Historiography, Authors as Actors, Routledge 2006. So we're expecting a book from Conrad every three, four years. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Conrad uh, to this uh, uh, Agia International Bilingual Summer School. Welcome, Conrad. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Bilal. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, for inviting me to this Agia Summer School. And as you um, started with books, I guess I can start with a personal comment um, somehow triggered by the title of this summer school, which is In Search of the Reader. And I have to admit in hindsight that when I published the book, The Written Word, a Social and Cultural History of Reading Practices some 10 years ago, a title such as In Search of the Reader would have actually been much more honest and to the point than the one I chose. Um, and this is the case because that book was very much an attempt to suggest ways of how to research reading, of how to identify readers, of how to understand the usage context of written artifacts. And the book turned out much less the definite history it claimed to be, but it was rather a first attempt to try out different appro approaches to be able to say something meaningful about reading and readers in the manuscript age. And the different approaches that I tried out in the book were in turn based on various source corpora. Um, so I'm a historian, so for me, <laughs> the approach is always defined by the corpus. I think other colleagues from one theory have other ways of how they define their approaches. So for me, it's um, defined by the source corpora to a large extent. So I looked at manuscript notes, I looked at endowment deeds, at illustrations, at library catalogs slash book lists and narrative sources. And it was clear that this multitude of source corpora, which obviously each required a different methodology, um, a different methodological approach, could not be exhaustively dealt with in one single book. And that's why it turned out in the end to be much less the different definite history that I had hoped to write initially when I started that project. <laughs> and after finishing the book um, in 2011, I thus felt the urge to drill deeper and to pursue one of these different approaches in more depth. And I've spent the better part of the last decade to pursue one approach or one source corpus in more depth, um, namely library catalogs and book lists in order to get a better understanding of how these lists function, how they can be used for the purpose of analyzing reading and readers. So, um, you can imagine that the title in search of the reader definitely addresses a research problem that has preoccupied me much longer than I initially thought. And to a large extent, I am obviously still in search of the reader and trying to figure out how I can identify him or her. Okay, um, so much for by way of introduction. Um, 
What I want to do in the following minutes is to offer some reflection on researching the reader and reading practices. And I will do so mostly on the basis of manuscripts and with reference to manuscripts, surprise, surprise. But I hope that at least some of the reflections are sufficiently general that also those who are not interested, um, particularly, particularly interested in manuscripts and working with other media, be it print or digital, or working on other research question also find some interesting points on what I will say. So the first point to make when talking about researching this topic is that the interest in readers and reading is a relatively new phenomenon in humanities at large as a sustained field of research of the um, here and there an article or a book, but as a sustained field of research is quite a new phenomenon. And the question is then obviously, how do we explain that many disciplines have started to take a serious interest in this topic? Obviously this goes well beyond Middle Eastern studies or Arabic studies or Islamic studies or however <laughs> what we are doing here. And I think there are two main trends in the background that have led to this more sustained interest and have pushed scholars in the humanities to think more systematically about that topic. And the first development is the obvious one, namely that we are in the moment experiencing a profound media revolution with the increasing digitization of how we store information, how we communicate. And digitization has obviously a fundamental impact on how we interact with the written text, on how we in the moment publish text, on how we in the moment distribute text. And there are many discussions going on among ourselves and many different ways of how this will play out. And these changing patterns of interacting with text has triggered a wide range of concerns. People read less, people read less carefully, people can't discern between reliable and unreliable information anymore, and so on. In particular, this concern about the ability of people to discern between reliable and unreliable information is, I think, quite a big topic, um, as we have seen over the last years. And the changes have also triggered, on the other hand, highly optimistic expectation. Readers have more agency of how to read. They have more agency of what to read. Open access means readers have access to more text. Thus, reading becomes more democratic, and so on. So you also have this whole bundle of very optimistic, positive um, association with this technological change. And the search and interest in how people read, who the readers are, what they read in response to the digital revolution, accompanied by the fears and hope I just mentioned, also pushed many fields in the humanities and also history to think about how we interact, how we have interacted with the written word um, over the past centuries. And to what extent there are similarities and differences in structural terms from previous moments when societies opted to adopt new technologies. And obviously we have the codex revolution some um, less than 2000 years ago, i.e. the move from the scroll um, to um, the codex. We have the paper revolutions, we have the print revolutions. And in this, these cases, we always have to use the term revolution in plural as on a global scale, different societies adopted these techn technologies at different points and at different paces, um, and thus had very different responses to um, technological change. So while reading history might seem at first glance rather arcane, it is actually one of those topics, and that's the good news, where it is not too difficult to explain in what sense this topic has relevance also for us today, i.e. as a medievalist, as I define myself, and it's one of those reassuring moments um, where I have the feeling I can explain to outsiders why um, it's worth while what I'm doing. The discussion around the role of digital social media as a tool for informing or misleading wider audiences, for instance, is not that unfamiliar from the discussions that we see in the 14th and 15th centuries when new genres emerge in Arabic speaking societies. When, when those in position of authority were very concerned about what these commoners would do with these unauthorized texts, what the nefarious impact um, would be of these misleading texts on the wider population. And um, I mean, I, I don't want to downplay what is going on in the moment. I don't want to downplay the concerns about fake news, et cetera. But at least it is striking that this is not something which is entirely unique to the technological change which we see in the moment. 
So the ongoing change in technology and the subsequent changes in reading practices has arguably played an important role in pushing the interests of the humanities in this direction. And the second change that explains why the humanities have become more interested in readers and reading is a change within humanities themselves. And here I refer to the rise of the category of meaning, which has been since the 1980s clearly one of the fundamental changes in the humanities. Um, and the increased interest in the category of meaning has been very much at the heart of several of the turns that have affected our fields over the past years and decades. Um, this is most evident in the cultural turn, i.e. with questions on what meaning people ascribe to specific objects, what meaning they ascribe to specific rituals, what meaning they ascribe to topographies, etc. And in consequence, the quest for meaning became a central concern for many colleagues who positioned themselves in new hybrid disciplines, such as, for example, historical anthropology. And the interest in the category of meaning has been particularly fruitful for bringing reading into the focus of the research, as reading is obviously the moment when individuals ascribe meaning to the text. And this in turn has pushed us to focus not only on the traditional protagonist in the humanities, who's obviously the author, the author has always been kind of in the focus of what we have been doing, but this interest in meaning also meant that the readers and as those having agency and in ascribing this meaning and came into our focus. And the classical study in that regard is obviously Carlo Ginsburg's The Cheese and the Worms, published in 1976, um, which was a first taste of how taking seriously the reader and sometimes very idiosyncratic ways readers might engage with text opens up entirely new areas of research. In this case, obviously, it's the story of this Miller who falls in the hand of the Inquisition and who has a very idiosyncratic reading of Christian scripture, which the Inquisitioners themselves are very surprised about and have really problems of how to deal with this guy and his ideas. Okay, so far for the broader context of why there has been an increase in the research on reading and on readers. And obviously such developments are much more complex, but I think that these two points, digital revolution, rise of meaning, have been crucial to get us where we are today. So after thinking about why we research reading and readers, let us turn to the second main part of my reflections, namely to the question of how we are actually able to research this topic. Reading, in contrast to writing, leaves few material traces, um, and researching reading is thus a particular challenge. But this does, does not need to preoccupy us too much, as it is a platitude. Um, any exciting research is difficult. If it's not difficult, it is probably not worth being done, so don't, we don't have to dwell too long on the difficulties. The question how reading can be researched can be broken down very simplistically into three broad questions. How did people read? What did people read? And who were the readers? I think in the end, if you look at the different research which is being done, um, you can kind of slot most research into some, into, under these questions or a combination of these questions. These questions in turn are linked to the specific fields of research. In, if you're historians, um, the first question is linked to cultural history. The what question is most linked to intellectual history, and the last question to social history. Um, are you looking at who was the reader in terms of class, in terms of gender, in terms of cultural capital, in terms of urban rural divides, etc.? The fact that research on reading and readers was very much pushed by the rise of the category meaning has meant that most of the research has always tended to consider reading as kind of a cultural practice. And in the field of history, for instance, this meant that reading was very much conducted at a, a research in reading was very much conducted under the label of historical anthropology. And that's quite interesting, quantitative approaches have played a relatively minor role, especially in Middle Eastern studies, Arab study, Arabic studies, Middle Eastern history, et cetera. Um, quantitative approaches might include counting the number of copies produced of a specific text or similar um, questions. 
but these quantitative approaches have not yet had a major impact. And this might change though, as we have different initiatives to build larger digital corpora with considerable amount of data. And I will return to these later on. And these might one day open up new research venues, um, but we are not there yet. Um, I've not seen yet that quantitative approaches have had a major impact on what we are doing. Okay. The question of how the people read might refer to issues such as the speed of reading, in particular, fast reading versus slow reading, um, or what Khaled Al-Ruayheb in his Islamic intellectual history um, called deep um, reading, where he detects this change in the Ottoman period in terms of reading patterns. Um, it is clear that we have an enormous range of reading speeds throughout the ages. Um, I still believe the record in speed reading during the manuscript age goes back to the 11th century, when Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi read the entire Sahih of al-Bukhari in three sessions only, because the teacher was meant to leave the next morning. Um, that must have been quite a feast when he read through this work. Um, in contrast, we have in the same period very different reading communities who take a lot of time. Um, they are, for example, reading communities who took not less than 10 years to read through one single work. Um, that's the history of Damascus by Ibn Masake. Um, so, as you see, two entirely different approaches how reading must have been conducted at this point. Another issue that comes up when asking how people read is the question of individual versus communal reading i.e. at what points did people decide to read on their own? At what points was reading conducted as a communal exercise? And this in turn brings us to another issue when thinking about how people read, namely silent versus loud reading. And once we start to think about how reading was done in terms of cultural practices, the concept of reading itself obviously becomes a research problem as it becomes increasingly difficult to say to what extent our notions um, of individual and silent reading, at least that's what I assume most of us associate with reading, it's an individual act, it's a silent act. And once we start to historicize historical practices of reading, it becomes increasingly difficult to say to what extent this notion makes sense in order to analyze reading practices in other periods when engagements with text might have taken forms that only map very awkwardly on our own restricted notions of individual and silent reading. But then in turn, then in turn obviously you have the problem where do you stop talking about reading? I, <laughs> where's the border of reading? When is a cultural practice not reading anymore? It is evident that there are still oceans of research topics out there if we want to research how people read in the manuscript ages alone. And I want to briefly discuss two examples of such venues for future research. For instance, the changing layouts and the developing ways of organizing the handwritten book have only been researched to a very low extent. Topics that should be and could be researched include, for instance, devices that facilitated the reader's navigation of the text. That might include, for example, the division into topical chapters um, or the use of section and chapter headings, or um, to give a second example, table of contents, of which we see over the centuries very different versions. I, we have very different ideas of what the table of content might be, um, how it should function, um, and how it can be used. And this obviously means that very different um, versions tell us a lot about how readers engaged with the text and about very different expectations of what the book was meant to do. Here we see, for instance, an early Ottoman copy from the 16th century, that's a grammatical work by the Egyptian Indian scholar at Damamini. Um, as you can see, there's a pleasant amount of notes by manuscript users on its title page. Um, you can see ownership statements as well as stamps by owners and libraries that have been, have been partly defaced. Um, however, these notes by manuscript users and the stamps do not concern us here. The main point for us 
is that this might be the this, this is the title page, um, but it is not the beginning of the book. Rather, if we go back some pages, we find that on the preceding pages, a table of contents was added, um, of which we see here only the last page that runs over page five pages. And this table of content lovingly gives all the page numbers. And obviously page numbers themselves are a rather new device at this point to navigate the codex. And this table of content obviously allowed much quicker access to the book's contents. Um, you always see um, the word fossil um, and then the page number on top of it. And then you see um, the um, content like um, fi Ram, assimilation, fi wak, fi abdibar, and so on. And this device was important enough that the compiler signed it off with a colophon, proudly identifying his authorship of the table of content. And that's a very common phenomenon, which we see at this point. in order to have um, kind of an author and um, by himself. In the 16th and 17th century, we see a massive surge in tables of contents that were added to old books. And also the new books, which were being written, now started to have a table of content or one, almost by default. And this certainly indicates a substantial change in reading practices. But we have so far only a limited understanding on how the layout and organization of the handwritten book in Arabic script changed over time. And we have virtually no attempt to link changing layout patterns and the emergence of such new devices to changing reading practices. And so that's a clear example of, of where still a lot of research can be done in order um, to get our head around the reader. Another example of evidence that has so far been hardly exploited are marginal notes that we find in many manuscripts by readers and reading communities, marginal notes that allow us to get an insight into actual reading practices. And by this, I do not mean the marginal commentaries that obviously would also be a possibility, i.e. where we ha have a sustained discussion of the content um, of the text. That's not what I mean here. But rather, I mean notes such as, for instance, Balara notes that we find on many manuscripts on how far a reader or a reading community got in one single reading session. They know of the, of the margins of the manuscripts, that's how far we got in this session, Balara. And these are, so to say, milestone notes in order to keep track of how far one got when you wanted to pick up in the next reading session, the following day or the following week or the following month or whenever you continued your reading. Um, as you see, for example, um, here, um, this is a work on Hadith written by the famous Syrian Hadith scholar, An-Nawawi, um, copied in the 11th century Hijri and currently held in Berlin. Of interest is here the note in the margins where we see um, a manuscript user um, that who states that he came in a reading session to this point, to this line, so that he knew where to pick up in the next session. And these notes are distributed across this manuscript so that they give, for instance, a wonderful insight into reading speed, as we can follow the reading pace of this reader. Here we see a note in the same manuscript, some 15 folia or 30 pages further on. And it is obvious that in many cases, these notes can be quite exhaustive. Um, they start with the handala invocation, alhamdulillah, thumma balara katibuhu kira'atan ilahahuna. And then also giving us details on the setup of this communal reading session, because the Kertib identifies himself as al-Fakir Abdurrahman al-Husseini. And we also get details on the participants, because it's um, he balara kira'atan al al-Sheikh al-Walid. So the father is also present, and al Akha Sayyid Ibrahim Yasma. Um, so the brother, most likely in this context, the biological brother Ibrahim, is also present. 
And finally, we also informed when this reading took place, in this case in the year 1078 Hitchry, and even more specifically, Wadalika Bitariach Leilat Asap, i.e. it's taking place on a Saturday night. And you can imagine that such data is a veritable goldmine in order to undertake research on reading practices from the angle of cultural history for thinking about how people in the past engaged with the written artifacts in very practical terms. There's thus no question that thinking about the devices allowing different modes of access to a given text and using marginal notes will give us a much better idea of how different individuals and communities interacted with the written world in various modes, and thus giving insights in variations according to period, um, i.e. It will allow us to pursue the diachronic changes because there is obviously no manuscript period or not, no homogenic um, manuscript period. There's no pre-modern reading in any meaningful of the term. That's only um, modernists um, when they talk about their own research and they need something else that they talk, talk about manuscript reading or the pre-modern reading. Um, but it will also give us the chance to look at variation according to region. Um, obviously, we have um, very different regional traditions. According to genre, what I just presented, the Balara notes, is very much a Hadith phenomenon. Um, variations according to class, according to gender, and so on. So even if we approach this topic within the framework of cultural studies, there's no question that the phenomena have to be analyzed by looking from other disciplinary angles, such as social history as well. So now let me turn briefly to the second question I mentioned above, what did people read? Um, here we are on a much more secure grounding because the field of Middle Eastern history or Islamic studies or Arabic studies has spent much more energy on this issue because where we stand today as a discipline is heavily influenced by the philological context in which many disciplines in the humanities gained new shape in the 19th century and intellectual history was deeply written into the DNA of our field, so to say. So there's a much longer um, research interest um, into this kind of question. And there are various ways of how to to search for the reader from the vanguard of reading curricula, of book corpora, and so on. And one of them is to try to reconstruct the reading diet of individual readers, and these are normally great men. Um, a classical example of this is Ethan Kohlberg's analysis of the books that Ibn Ta'us, a 13th century Shiite scholar, had access to. Um, so this is very much a book about the reading curriculum of an individual. The title refers to the library of Ibn Ta'us, which is misleading um, because this book only gives us an idea about the books Ibn Ta'ud read, not about the books which he actually owned or which he might have had in his personal library. Another venue to think about what people read are actual libraries or book collection, and this is obviously very close to my own interest and my own take on this issue over the last year. And this field of research has a very interesting um, genealogy, so to say, because in methodologically innov innovative ways, it was very much inaugurated and to some extent driven by two colleagues already during the 1960s. And that's namely the former director of the Syrian National Library, Yusuf Al Aish, um, who published his book on pre modern libraries, originally in French in 1967, then subsequently translated to Arabic by Nazar Abad. Um, and he was the first to systematically use manuscript notes in order to reconstruct vanished libraries. And the second um, and colleague driving the field was Abdel Latif Ibrahim, who is the pioneering Egyptian scholar of documentary studies at large, obviously. Anything related to documentary, it's always Abdel Latif Ibrahim in the 1960s, but who also was the first to systematically use documentary evidence, in his case, documents linked to endowments, in order to study historical libraries. The work of these two scholars, Alaish and um, Ibrahim, and the innovative methodologies was not really taken up and further developed for a very long time 
with regard to the history of reading. And it is probably fair to say that they came too early for this research field. Um, because as I discussed, it really only kicked off um, from the 1980s onwards as a fully fledged historical research field. Um, and their work so somehow remained isolated and only in the 1990s we increasingly understood how important it was. In order to illustrate how focusing on book collection might contribute to a history of readers and reading, I would like to briefly talk um, in this last part about my current um, research project, which brings us to Jerusalem, namely the Haram al-Sharif, where the Islamic Museum houses some 1,000 documents, the famous Haram documents that go back to the Mamluk period. And among these documents, we find three sheets that refer to the estate of a deceased person called Burhan al-Din Nasseri, who passed away in Jerusalem in the year 789 Hijri. Um, this Burhan al-Din Nasseri um, left some 50 documents, um, which became part of the overall Haram al-Sharif collection, which I believe to be his personal archive. And as you can see from the class marks of these three sheets, when class marks were assigned to these documents in the 1970s, those doing it believed these sheets to be three completely separate documents. As you can see, it's number 61, 180, and 532, are completely different numbers. Um, but now it's clear it is one single document. And this document is at the center of my current book project on which I work together with my colleague Saida Jumani here in Berlin. Originally, the sheets were folded in this way to form a daftar. Um, this was the usual way of how in that period legal documents were produced and legal information stored, documentary legal information stored. I, it's quite different from the codex. The dafta was more specifically used to register the public auction of the estate of this Burhan al-Din, it's Daftar al-Mizad. Um, and the public auction was the usual way um, of how to divide estates. Oh. Imagine there was always, yeah, it's quite, um, risky um, to divide the estate between 10 persons on the basis of objects and to decide what exact, which objects, objects exactly contra, constitute three eighths um, of the inheritance, for example, and by converting objects to money, it's much easier. And that's why this list is organized by the name of the buyers, i.e. those who attended the public auction in order to purchase the items on sale. Um, that's pretty standard as far as we believe. And this DAFTA is of interest for thinking about reading because the items that were on sale were mostly books. Um, so Burhan Adin was a very avid book collector. So that under each buyer, we find the titles of the book um, that he purchased. All the buyers are male in this document. So um, it's always he. Um, in some cases, obviously, we have some 400 objects that were, were sold in this auction. And among these 400 objects, 300 are books, but there are also cooking pots, um, there are sandals, um, there are shirts. So we also have the day-to-day -day, um, objects that this Burhan Adin used. And in addition, we find the price for each book. That's very exciting because it's one of the best sources which we have for actual book prices as well as the sum total that the buyer in question had to pay for all the books and perhaps other objects that he had bought. This is the only document with books linked to the estate of an individual that has so far emerged for the pre-Ottoman period. For the Ottoman period, this is a very normal document. Um, for the um, 17th and 18th century, um, we have loads of documents in the sigil art linked to book ownership, linked to the estates where we find book and where we can conduct large scale projects. For the pre-Ottoman period, for pre-1500, this is the only document which has emerged so far um, for Bilat Sham and probably for um, the wider Arabic lands. And this document is particularly interesting as this Burhan Adin is not known as a prominent scholar. He did not author a single work. He's not mentioned in any biographical dictionary. He's not mentioned anywhere except in the documents which he himself left behind. Mm -hmm. 
from other documents that have come down to us, I think these 50 documents and that are linked to his life, we know that he lived a rather modest life in Jerusalem. Um, he was a part-time reciter of Mi'at sessions. Um, Mi'at, that's ritual, ritual um, recitation sessions just before or after the communal prayer in which Quran, Hadith, and Hikayat al-Salahin um, is recited. And these part-time reciters were paid much less than the mudarisin in the madrasas, for example. And so for most of the life, he rented the house he lived in. So what we have is here a unique insight into the books that a rather average individual found in a small town such as Jerusalem, who was not part of the world of leading scholars or part of the social elite of his society. In total, this rather average individual owned roughly 300 books, which is a very impressive number, one has to say. Um, and if we look at the thematic distribution, which we will not discuss in any detail here, um, there are not too many surprises. Um, Quranic science is coming first. Um, that's mostly recitation, um, kira'a, and also masahif, i.e. copies of the Quran itself, though Burhan al -Din did not own any complete copy of the Quran. It's always only parts of the Quran that he owned, but he owned a lot of different parts of the Quran. And the second most important um, field is hadith, and then the third one is fiqh. But more interesting is that the document gives us the name of the buyers, and thus a whole list of further book owners in Jerusalem. In total, we find more than 50 buyers of books on the three sheets. And that's quite a unique insight, which we get into book ownership on a larger scale. Some of these are individuals who are known to us because they were scholars or they were part of the elite, political elite. Um, and these are particularly those which we find in the beginning of the daftar. Here you see the first page and the first buyer, that's a Sheikh Anajmi, um, who is a very prominent scholar from the Banu Jama'a, dynasty of scholars. And the second one is al Makar Amasiri, who is um, a leading Mamluk officer who was Na'ed Sultana, um, the vice regent at some points. However, if we go to the back of the Dafta, at the end of the Dafta, we see a very different social world. Hardly any of these buyers who are indicated here are identifiable. They're entirely unknown as much as Burhan al -Din. And as you can see here, these buyers only bought very few books. Um, for example, um, this one called Badr al-Din and Muqasim only bought one Majmu'a, um, i.e. Uh, multiple text or composite manuscript, nothing else. Via these buyers, the daftar thus gives us a unique insight into the high number of households in which books were held in a town in the 14th century. And it thus also gives us an idea of how widely spread reading spaces were and how complex the reading topography of such a town was, a reading topography that went well beyond the usual suspects, such as madrasas and mosques. On the map which you see, the circles indicate the households of those individuals who are identifiable, i.e. those spaces in the town associated with elite households, leading scholars, scholars, members of the political elite. It is nice to be able to pin down specific households associated with reading, which is only possible because of this document. Yet more interesting are really the question marks. And these question marks indicate those buyers who are not known to us such as this Badr al-Din ibn Khasim, those who are not identifiable in any ways, the commoners, so to say. And they are much more interesting as they indicate readerships beyond the grand scholars and the elites. And rather, we are here able to see readers who are normally below the radar of the sources that we have. What this document offers is thus a rare insight into the patterns of book ownership in wider society a world that is not, or which is hardly visible to us from the chronicles, biographical dictionaries, or other narrative sources. And these insights from the daftar indicate a world where reading spaces were distributed all across the town, and they were distributed across a very wide social spectrum, and rates of literacy 
must have been staggeringly high. The question obviously remains whether owning a book is necessarily identical to reading that book. I mean, we, that has been commented upon many times. All of us own many books which we have never read, and we have read many books which we do not own. And there are many reasons why individuals have books and display books, including the urge to display a certain learnedness or the wish to belong to a specific cultural milieu. And I guess the importance of the bookshelf in one's back in academic Zoom sessions shows that this has obviously not changed too much today. However, in the case of Borhan Adin, there are certain factors that make it at least likely that he was also a reader of the books that he owned. Among these factors is, for example, that he owned this very considerable amount of documents, this private archive of 50 documents, which has come down to us. Um, i.e. he was very much engaged in pragmatic literacy and more importantly he was a part-time reciter and thus professionally engaged with the written word to some extent. So if we go back to the question underlying this discussion, what did people read? There are probably many other venues that have not been explored yet in any exhaustive sense. When it comes to individual readers, we have seen Ethan Kohlberg's attempt to make sense of the reading program of Ibn Ta'us by trying to identify the sources that Ibn Ta'us used in his books. And that's obviously something which could be easily done for many other cases. And another venue to look at individual readers are reading notes that such readers left on books. And that's a phenomenon that is particularly widespread in Arabic manuscript cultures. And that's well known. It's a unique research to conduct large scale research projects on reading and reading practices. Before we have seen the Balara notes in the margin of texts, and we have seen this gives an insight into the reading patterns. Um, but they are mostly popular in one genre only, hadith, i.e. they cannot really be generalized across the uh, manuscript spectrum. And what I'm interested here in turn are notes that are much more widespread, which we find on many more manuscripts in very different genres. And these are notes in which manuscript users indicate that they have read the entire book. Um, here, for instance, a manuscript that is held in Jerusalem um, in the Khalidiyah library, but it has no link to Boran Hadin whatsoever, um, sadly so. Um, that's the famous grammatical didactic poem by Ibn Malik, al al in a copy probably from the 10th century Hijri. And that's a nice example where we see that numerous readers proudly left their names as readers of this work, such as this note starting with the term Tala'a and other such notes where readers left the name with the same um, verb beginning, Mutala'a, but also further notes showing that individual read this book, such as this Kara'ahu note. There's no question that such reading notes have an enormous potential for future research projects on readers and reading practices, especially if we are in search of the reader. That's exactly the point where we have to look. But the problem is that we have so far not a resource that allows us to deal with this data as big data, so to say. Rather, the research is stuck in using very small and rather random sample of notes such as I just did in the previous slide. There's one project that is in the process of building up a larger corpus of such notes, the Bibliothek Arabica project in Leipzig in Germany, where especially Boris Liebrens is transcribing large numbers of ownership and reading notes. This project has not yet gone online with its data, but once and when this will happen, we certainly will have a major shift in the way we can write the history of readers and reading practices. And that's the moment where I assume that quantitative approaches will really kick in in our field. In the moment, any samples which we have are too random to honestly speak about quantitative approaches. But once this goes online, we really have for the first time data which will allow us to conduct such um, projects. I hope that these thoughts on the topic of your summer school have provided some insight into how in one specific field, namely working with handwritten artifacts, research has developed and might develop in future years. And the main message I want to convey is obviously how much space for research there is 
how little has been done so far and how many exciting and thrilling projects are still waiting out there um, to be conducted over the next years. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. I have to unshare. Thank you, Conrad, so much for this uh, keynote speech that introduced us to the state of research on readers and reading uh, touched into the adoption of new technologies, but also introduced us to forthcoming and fascinating new research via this journey into how did people read, what did people read, and who were the readers, a journey that employed uh, so many disciplines, cultural history, intellectual history, social history. And I am sure we have a few questions and uh, we have around 30 minutes uh, for Q and A. Um, <clears throat> just raise your hand um, via Zoom, of course. <laughs> And the uh, floor will be yours. And if we have, okay, we have uh, the first question from Torsten. Hi, everyone. Um, it was a very great talk. I have a side question, and that is uh, regarding the reading notes. Um, I'm interested in what Conrad might be thinking about the connection between patterns of ownership and the ability to leave reading notes at all. Uh, in my <clears throat> anecdotal experience, it seems more likely that uh, privately owned copies uh, would get reading notes from friends of the owner or so, but um, uh, books in book endowments would not so often get reading notes. Mm, yeah, no, I mean, that's entirely fair. I mean, um, I think so far we have a very let's say optimistic and often naive approach to manuscript notes as if they would reflect what has happened to a manuscript over the centuries. But obviously the ability to write notes was heavily influenced by class, by gender, by cultural capital and so on. And it's striking, for example, in terms of ownership notes, how few individual owners left their notes on the manuscript. I mean, what is striking is not the amount of manuscript notes, what we have, but the absence of manuscript notes. And just from the corpora on which I've been working, you know, like these Abdul Hadi manuscripts in Damascus, um, and right now this Qur'an Adin corpus, what always strikes me is how few notes are actually left on these manuscripts by the people I know who owned them from other ways of looking at them. Um, and I guess exactly the same is true for reading notes, that what we will learn at some point, or what, what basically once we have sufficient data and we can really conduct serious um, project on this kind of material, um, I guess um, one of the fascinating projects or lines of research will exactly what you said, Torsten, I to think about who actually could claim the right to leave reading notes, which was certainly not evenly distributed across period, across genre, across gender, across social class, um, and so on. But to be honest, I mean, I'm, let's say, I, 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 I don't have enough, let's say, data that I would be able to say anything meaningful on that inconclusive term that I could always already say there is a trend which I um, see. Um, just one example, it's anecdotal once again, um, but this Burhan Adin Anasari and um, probably owned these manuscripts not longer than seven years on average. That's how it looks um, from, from, from what we see. Um, but we don't have a single ownership note on a manuscript. He never, he never wrote one. And all these 50 buyers who appear afterwards, you know, whom we know, they didn't write the name on the manuscripts. And that's, you know, that's just a snapshot, which we have from the Dafta, you know, it's really just a, a, a snapshot and they are absent. So we can imagine what happened, <laughs> apart from these two years or seven years, which we can see, what happened to these manuscripts, which is not visible at all. 
we have a question uh, from Christian, but also from uh, Mikhail. Yeah, Mikhail was first and then Christian. Go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Mikhail, you, you, you're muted. You are still muted. You need to click on the microphone. Okay. Okay, now you're muted. Excellent. Go ahead. It's okay. Yes, very good. Hello. Uh, let's introduce myself. I'm Professor Monsef Bakay, uh, director of the African Studies Laboratory at Algiers University, and uh, let's say I found very very interesting, uh, let's say your topic. But I would like to ask a, a question. Uh, what is your assessment on the Arabic manuscripts in both in uh, Adar in Algeria and uh, Tombuktu in Mali? My second question, as we know, manuscripts are very, very important in describing African societies in the, let's say, uh, middle, uh, middle and ancient times. Uh, so, my questions will focus on uh, some aspects of sociological and anthropological life in in uh, in Adrar and uh, and uh, and uh, Tombuktu. Do you think that the preservation of these manuscripts? Uh, would contribute in casting lights on uh, medieval and ancient Africa. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I mean, um, the first question is um, embarrassingly so. Um, I have to answer with a very brief um, an um, answer. My work has really been from Dar al Kutub al Misriya eastwards and northwards, um, and mostly on Bilat Sham um, and in Istanbul as far as it is concerned with Bilat Sham and a little bit Egypt. So I can claim no expertise whatsoever with regard to the two libraries that you mentioned, I would be thrilled um, to learn more about them. Um, and um, I mean, it's um, very well known that, um, well, yeah, especially in the German context, um, North Africa has not been a <laughs> particularly focus of our research, to put it mildly, uh, or we have um, entirely, or many of us have entirely neglected it. Um, and I guess um, I'll, I'll, I'll be moving to the to the Center for Manuscript Studies at the University of Hamburg in the near um, future, um, where many colleagues have been working on, for example, to move to manuscripts and I'm looking forward to um, learning from them. Um, and as um, for the second question, um, that was basically on the preservation of these manuscripts with regard, I, I wasn't quite sure where, where the question headed. It, I think it was about the importance of studying these manuscripts to mm. uh, the history of uh, of Africa. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess for it's 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 clear that I mean manuscripts have gained an enormous importance since the 19th century when they became machtutat and were not kutub um, anymore and started to be redefined. Um, that they had an enormous importance in the eyes of those societies who collected them. And if you look at the efforts, which were, and now again, sorry, <laughs> but my examples are from Bilal Sham um, and, and Mr. Um, but if you look at the local societies and local actors who very actively started to, 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 to collect these manuscripts and um, who were worried about the translocation of these manuscripts to European and to some extent US American um, collections who started to build up collections very consciously so in order to keep these um, artifacts in 
their own societies. Um, and um, Timbuktu, I think, is, is just an amazing example of a society for whom the um, preservation of these artifacts has been absolutely crucial and a wonderful example um, of how they pre were preserved in this, this local context. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you. Christian? Thank you very much for a fascinating talk and a really extensive survey which offers much food for our summer school. Um, I have one question regarding social history and the question who were the readers and you mentioned gender as a dimension for the research. So I was just wondering if you came across female readers evidence, written evidence for female readers or where do we have to look or can we look for an evidence for female readers? And related um, to this question, also the division between urban and rural readers. Um, are there any um, allusions to rural readers, or is it really mostly um, well an urban phenomena, and we do not have any written evidence for rural uh, reading communities and so on? Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thanks. Yes, so I mean, the the if if you look at the manuscript of corpus which we have in the moment from the you know normal angle it's a very male and it's a very um world but um obviously that's not the end of the story um in hadith manuscripts um you have um quite an important um ratio of women um that's partly what um Asma Sayed um, discussed in her books um, on um, female participation in scholarship, um, particularly in Hadith um, scholarship. Um, but I think that's one of the points where we come to who had the right or who could claim the right to leave notes on manuscripts. Um, and the male dominated world was probably or the male dominated world, which we see in the notes so far, is probably not a reflection of the actual gender distribution of book ownership. And this is something, mm -hmm. once we look at the sigillat, at once we have, obviously we don't have them for the 14th and 15th century, but if once we have the sigillat <laughs> um, for the 16th and 17th century, we see female book ownership. But if we are then identify, able to identify the smoking gun, a, one of those manuscripts, which I actually mentioned in these in Sigilat, we often see that the women did not belong to those who did not leave notes on the manuscripts. Um, so obviously there are notes, that's, that's not a problem. We will, if there are, we can work with them. But I think there's a clear bias towards, um, or, uh, the, the, the Ottoman case where we have better sources shows that we have a clear gender bias and who can leave notes. And with regard to urban rural, um, to be quite honest, I'm stuck on that. I've, I mean, I'm, I'm always quite frustrated um, that my world always ends more or less um, in a radius 10 kilometers around the center of Damascus or Jerusalem and um, how little villages um, come up. Um, yeah, um, to, yeah, I'm stuck. Um, I've, I've, I've never developed basically an idea of how to explain that or um, a strategy of, of, of how to work my, my, my way um, around this problem. Thank you very much. But I mean, there, there's one big issue, which is really I mean, the, the elephant in the room when it comes to manuscripts. And that's the same for any media, you know, which you have to be aware of. I mean, how selective the corpora are you working on? On mm -hmm. manuscripts, obviously, we only get the official libraries, the Dado Kutter, the uh, Magdal Watanir, et cetera. And to some extent, they are a drop in the ocean compared to private manuscript ownership in, I mean, just thinking of the Shawish Library in Beirut and Jordan, which is um, not that far away from the Syrian National Library. <laughs> it's a private library which has never been catalogued and nobody has used these manuscripts to a large extent. Um, and these official libraries sourced themselves very much out of the wakfs in the cities. You know, so in the 19th century, what is today the Maktab al in Damascus is 
in the beginning is basically reconfiguration of the Aukaf of Damascus. And then the works of Aleppo were added, et cetera. So it might, I mean, just I mean, that's just an idea. It might be <laughs> that once we start to look at these other collections, which have a more varied, let's say, provenance, that there are other kind of geographical distributions might emerge. We have a question for yes from Yasmin. Hi, Yasmin. Hi, Bilal. Thank you very much for a very interesting. Uh, lecture or keynote. I have a question if you've ever seen any evidence of censorship, whether by, mm -hmm. you know, the reader himself or the <laughs> producer of the manuscript. And I'm thinking about explicit censorship and implicit censorship, where just portions of a pre existing matin were not copied because they are no longer in. Um, in uh, acceptable with the current, uh, I don't know, ideology, political climate, uh, context, uh, whatever. Because you see this in hadith quite a lot, where from one collection to the other, certain portions of the hadith just vanish because uh, of uh, whatever reasons. So is this also present in, in the manuscripts? Yeah, I mean, the the, the 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 let's say the the most blatant example are illustrations um, where you see massive intervention in illustrations once they do not fit the um, perception of what is religiously admissible anymore. And the most famous examples, obviously, all these um, Siyad and Nabi, um, the biographies of the Prophet, which are illustrated and when later users um, often deface the illustration um, of. The Prophet Muhammad, and um, because they thought it's not admissible to present his face, um, etc. In terms of text copying, to be honest, that's beyond what I'm doing. Um, I'm sure that, I mean, this this is there. And if we just think about the Sahih al Bukhari, I mean, the most one of the amazing things in our field is that we are still so far away from a critical edition of, you know, the the, the Sahih works, which would reflect. The manuscript background um, of um, these um, works and where we see in the 12th 13th century still quite a fluid manuscript tradition of what was perceived to be part of al-bukhari whether this is necessarily censorship I'm, I'm not that sure about it at least we see a lot of fluidity and once you start to look at that in more detail once we have a study on the let's say manuscript tradition of al-bukhari probably would be able to see it um wait where you see it in a very vivid um um way um that's um to a large extent um for example popular um biographies um the um, popular epics um so to say um where readers often could get um quite angry um, about um, what was in these texts and um, Elif Caesar, um, she's just finishing her PhD, for example, on the um, 19th um, century um, Ottoman epic tradition in the Ottoman world. And she has shown the fights between readers about various aspects, but also about the text and where you see quite angry reactions and crossing out and corrections um, to the text. So in this um, popular genre, for example, um, you see a very nice reflection, not of scholarly censorship, not necessarily of political authorities um, um, intervening, but interestingly, so of very different sections of society who claim the right to correct, to alter um, the texts um, and so on. And just the, the, the um, Last bit, I mean, that's, I know that's not what, what we we're heading on, but what we're talking about, um, manuscript notes, but what you see quite often is um, a defacing of manuscript notes, um, especially library stamps of previous library, which are being changed and, um, and defaced in order to hide um, the provenance of a manuscript, um, for example. Thank yeah. you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Khairi Duma. Thank you. Uh, 
thanks many thanks for professor conrad for the his interesting uh, talk uh, i'm i'm contemplating about the, the the three questions the main questions of this uh, lecture how did people read what did people read and who were the readers actually i'm, I'm asking about why <laughs> <laughs> so what did people read and why mm. because for example when we study novel in 19th century we are we have been told that the, the readers the young readers started to read the, the, this new literary genre or this new art and and we have many many uh, magazines and many readers and something like this the question is why at the, uh, the the special moment or the exact moment we have many readers for example now why in arab world we have many readers of the bestseller uh, novels or something like this if in, in special periods we, we can find some people read politics some people read uh, horror the question why i th i think it is a very important question to ask mm. No, it's implied in, in your book, but, but it's very important to... <laughs> uh, mm. No? Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, 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 okay. entirely, you're entirely, entirely right, and I guess there are different venues to do so. I'm just thinking next year in, 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 in Istanbul, the mm. Manuscript Center will have a conference on um, Sebeb Italiv, um, the reason for writing. Um, so probably we need to have yeah. a second conference for the Sebebi Kira um, for the reason of reading. Um, it might be more challenging to get enough speakers for that topic in compared to the um, writing um, topic. But um, for example, um, what is interesting is the 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 the, the, the change obviously the, the changes in the modes of how um people engage with specific topics and you know what what, what mm. i tried to show in my last book is how the changes in hadith reflect very different concerns about what hadith was meant to do and the shift from small booklets to massive compendia and forth and back um, shows it tells us a lot about why mm. people were interested in interested in these books and the same obviously goes for um, the, 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 the popular genres, which must be highly entertaining, you know, which, which, which must just must have been fun. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we have so few manuscript evidence for popular, popular in the sense of being widely read, not in being in contrast to elite, or popular just being read across the spectrum. Um, from the 15th, 16th, 17th century and the these epics I just mentioned, um, once we have the manuscript evidence, you know, from the 18th century and especially from the 19th century, it really becomes fun. If you look at the doodle, the, 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 the pictures they write, they, 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 they put on these manuscripts to insult each other. And there are these different soldiers who call each other names, which I can't name here. I mean, that would be way too indecent. Um, and, and, and you really see a very rowdy group of people clustering around these manuscripts. And you can imagine a, a very different world from the lofty scholarly world where we often see manuscripts um, circulating. So in short, yes, you're entirely right. So um, the why question mm -hmm. would be a very fun question. Thank you. I see no one raising their hands. So I think we can stop here. Thank you so much, Conrad. Uh, these questions will remain with us for the next four or five days. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the audience as well and for the questions. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for having me. And um, if there's some, 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 some mileage in that for the next days, I'm the more delighted and wish you all the best for the um, summer school and hope to see you soon and without Zoom at some point. Hopefully soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.